We Any usually report? we would usually work out of the French restaurant because that was the nicest hotel. Each restaurant usually had multiple restaurants, but the French restaurant was always the nicest one. So we would often work out of the French kitchen to do Ken's dinners. And his, his dinners were the East-West cooking. So there was always like the French chefs would be the liaison, you know, and uh, the, the staff was largely, you know, the, at least the sous chefs and the chef were French and they would have locals as most of the kitchen brigade. But, uh -huh. you know, it, it's interesting because in those days, I and mean, we're talking about 80s, uh -huh. 80s, the French chefs totally were bringing everything in from France in their restaurants. They would not use, hardly any of them used anything local at all. They were still flying in and literally everything. And this was all over Asia. Uh, so, everything was coming in from France. Uh, there was one guy in Hong Kong, his name was Gray Kuntz. Um, and he, he actually shopped in the markets locally and he was, but he was the exception. Nobody else was doing that uh, in those days. So uh, uh, it was pretty rare and yeah. Uh, yeah. So this, um, the American chef pointed out that the transition that Ducasse uh, sparked by yeah. serving just pork and potato and taking over for um, Rambouchon. The yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Was that about the same time it happened in San Francisco? You know, where we, I remember in San Francisco, there was the um, uh, Flying Saucer Cafe. Do you remember this one? On, on, that, that was great. Wasn't that an amazing place? I would go there with my, my, my little budget, have a yeah. glass of wine and one hors d'oeuvre. And this was a dinner for me. It was enough. And, you know, it was $20 or something like that. And I could afford it. Yeah. Um, but this was the beginning of sort of architectural food. What what years was that, would you say? Uh, yeah, that probably was in the, uh, in the early to mid 80s. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think so. so. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But he was... He was except well. It was uh, yeah. He was he was exceptional. I mean, I, he had that because uh, because I worked. I mean, I, when I was going to cooking school, I actually uh, spent a little bit of time at, with him, not at Flying Saucer because he hadn't opened that yet. But he was he was working as a chef at uh, I think uh, the the ferry. Down, down by the ferry building at one of the one of the restaurants. Like one but, market or something? Um, no, it was actually off right on right on the Embarcadero. I can't remember if it was called oh. Ferry, Ferry Plaza or something like that. He was the sh chef de cuisine for maybe a year or so there. Um, what was his but, name? Oh, uh, uh, Albert, Albert Torgman, T-J-O-R-D-M-A-N. He committed suicide. Oh, weird. But he was like, yeah, he was an he was an interesting guy. Yeah. Uh, but his food was so fanciful. You know, the way it was built, everything was like different. Every little, you know, instead of just putting vegetables on, each one was this weird creation. And oh, the plates were just amazing. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was such fun and yeah, all right. edible. All and edible. edible. <laughs> Everything tasted good. It mm. wasn't just for show, although mm. it was amazing to look at as well. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, no. That at that time, you know, that guy who the American the, the American chef uh, Dan Barber, uh -huh. that place that he started in New York, upstate New York. Um, yeah, that was pretty much the epitome of what I think a lot of people from the table, that was basically what, you know, mm -hmm. everybody was trying to emulate. And uh, um, yeah, he's, and he's still doing, I guess he's still there and still doing well. Yeah. So, he yeah. said, what did, what did the subtitle say? The most important chef in America or something like that? I don't yeah, know. yeah. And then, you know, there's, there were a few, uh, I mean, I think, uh, even here 
No, Northern California, there are a few, there are a few places that sort of try to sort of, uh, you know, I mean, because we certainly have access to all the produce nearby and, right, right, you know, right. what was going on at, you know. Hubert Keller and Michael Mina. Yeah, yeah, and even, you know, what was going on when Shape and East started getting sure. produce in from neighbors up in the up the hill, we're bringing in stuff, you know, and. They started. Yeah. They started naming all their, the provenance of all their produce, right. and all those kinds of things started. You know, that ideas. Those ideas started percolating, and so, yeah. Yeah, really, really, really California was. I, I think maybe there's there's a, a regular exchange with Paris and San Francisco. One might say, and yeah, yeah. Although yeah. the French in those days when. The French were still into cooking, mm. you know. They would always make friend make make fun of like, well, what with like Alice and Chapinese, they would go there and, you know, they would eat something and it would be like the most perfect peach, or the most perfect tomato, but basically it wasn't cooked. Right. They would say, "Oh, this is really good, but this is not cooking. This is like shopping." Or this is like, you know. <laughs> but this is also part of it. You know, if, if something does, I mean, also, yeah. like Ducasse said in the beginning, you know, if you're not in good company, you are better in company with a carrot or a courgette, yeah. a perfect carrot or a perfect courgette. No, I, I think you know? they've, they've evolved and, and he was so into vegetables. Mm. But in the old days, I mean, you know, the French were so much into technique, not so much product. You know, right? I mean, you know, right. I mean, obviously they wanted good products, but they were more into what we could do with it, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, the secret. I wonder, I wonder where the sous vide, I guess, came from Paris and or from, from France. Yeah, um, yeah. Interesting yeah. to know that the still the, the holders of the most Michelin stars, well, that was 2016. Yeah. And, uh, the write-up even says he only has 18, but he has 21. So he got uh, more so, stars right. in between. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That's this is. I mean, does this the Michelin stars? Is that still the? Um, I guess the the quest la quest of of many chefs. Uh, chef? Yeah. I mean, I think it still has meaning, but you know, for. It's, I don't think it's something that uh, as many chefs aspire to anymore because mm -hmm. a lot of people are just not even willing to play that game or wanting to, or, or they're realizing that it's not a game that's set up for everyone to succeed wow. in. So ah. like, why even, why even go there? Yeah. You know? There's because these days, you know, it's like it's it's not the only way to to get to be successful. Right. Well, I understand they're even going to street food and giving Michelin stars yeah. to street food now, which is that's great. Yeah. This is the, the anthropology of food and, and right. yeah, you know, yeah. much broader thinking and, and uh, that pleases me to know that there's not only, you know, an aspiration to perfect the the, the, yeah. the palate but also to look at the world food supply and how do we help people learn about themselves and their world through their palate and yeah and yeah make sure we feed people you know that's it's insane that the world food supply is so maldistributed uh, yeah. yeah 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 you know um i was in kazakhstan for a job, not cooking, but, but teaching design thinking. And I was, um, I got to taste the cuisine, a little bit of horse meat. And it was mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a noodle, like a ravioli kind of thing. Oh. And, uh, you know, it was fascinating. But one of the other the delicacies is camel milk. Oh. And um, so the workshop I was giving is a design thinking wor workshop, innovation. It's an innovation process. And so we were looking at uh, problems with um, food, 
and <laughs> they hadn't given me a, an actual problem. So I often go to food because everyone has a relationship with food. So the, 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 the problem was how might we find a way to um, bring more healthy, uh, simple foods, healthy, simple, uh, regional foods uh, to um, schools. I think it was something like this because I was working in a university. And the things that came up with, the possibilities, I mean, why not camel milk cheese? You know, and it, it's a little bit, and I thought just people in the United States would be so interested to, to try this because it's a, it's a taste from another place in the world. And I don't know if anybody has gone up with it, but that's what we do. We go out and give these workshops and birth, birth these ideas and hopefully inspire people to continue using the process and, and coming up with these ideas. But um, yeah, m meanwhile, while I was there, I met uh, a restaurant tour who has, he runs three giant <laughs> restaurants in Almaty, Kazakhstan. And one's a sushi restaurant. So there's a, I think there's a lot of Japanese influence there. And another one was a, an Italian restaurant. So of course that travels too. And, and, and then there was another one uh, smaller, but three all connected, just giant. I don't think the guy ever slept, but mm. um, I, I found um, that connection and I invited him to, to watch this, but it would have been, uh, you know, 1130 at night, I think in, in Kazakhstan. But, well, I mean, what do you think? Do you think there would be an interest in tasting camel milk or horse milk products? I don't know about the horse milk, something with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, in, in France, they're, they're dwindling, but um, they still have uh, shops to specialize in uh, the horse. horse ah, uh -huh. You remember That's when true. I was there, I had, you know, bought some pâtés or something like that. Uh, um, so yeah, they're not as popular and or prevalent as they used to be, but I imagine there's still some around. Mm, mm. Yeah, the, um, the Gobi Desert scene in this film. <laughs> that yeah. was uh, amazing just to show us a kind of a palate cleanser, but also, I mean, those mining companies, I recently saw a film that was sort of um, disparaging the mining companies for the, um, you know, the, the work that they're doing in these, what look like nothing, but people do live there. And mm -hmm. I loved his comment. The guy comes in on a motorcycle and he says, there's customers everywhere. Right, right. <laughs> I wonder how that project is going. I mean, it, it would be, I guess, super opulent that um, you know, people would either have to fly in there by helicopter. Uh, yeah, before COVID, it seems like uh, seems like the, the sort of the the Gobi, the Gobi in Mongolia was sort of a sort of a one of the destinations for a lot of people traveling. Oh. You know, more exotic traveling was sort of on, on the list, it seemed. Before, uh, before, yeah, you know, they're showing up the Mongolian cinema and Kazakh cinema, all yeah. up there that seems so bad, but it's a great place to shoot because it looks like the moon, but so does Eastern Oregon. So, you know, we might not have to travel so far, but there's also a Soviet trained film community, film uh, industry and, um, it's pretty pretty top notch, and uh, I've seen some of the the films in in Berlin, and um, it's a beautiful, beautifully produced, and yeah, now yeah, that's that's another place that needs some um, innovation. I think is the, <laughs> the film industry too. So <laughs> I'm working on it. That's what we're doing here with Screen Three Sixty TV. Is hopefully innovating a little bit and and making it a little more democratic because. It also has to come, even though it's a you know, hundred years old cinema, it uh, started with this, you know, sort of opulence and uh, very, and still a lot of the money is tied up in a few places. And so to make mm -hmm. it a little more democratic, that's hopefully what the internet is doing. And hopefully we're contributing to that too, but uh, <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Well, I'm sorry Daniel couldn't uh, join us, but I'll send him a link to this so that he can um, enjoy it at some point on his own. I don't know what they're they're doing. I just uh, looked at the website. They're doing some dinners in a movie and some takeout. Yeah. yeah boy, they're now yeah, they're. Uh, they might be, there might be some very small things they might be doing, but they're pretty much shut down. I would, I would, I would yeah. imagine. So. Elopements, I saw. <laughs> they're encouraging people to elope, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, really sweet. Really sweet. Yeah. Well, you're looking well, and are you, are you feeling hopeful? Yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty good and, and hopeful, although... I don't know, politically it's, you know, I mean, at least we're out of the worst. Yeah. Out of the worst situation, but the situation that's that we're in is not exactly great either. You know, I just got a, a note from a friend who worked for the German embassy in Mexico. And he said, I said, can you believe how defiant these Republicans still are? Mm -hmm. And he says, like mobsters. It's true, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the influence that Trump left behind. Wow. Awoken, awoken something that was there, but he's definitely, in, they're emboldened. They're, you yeah. Know, yeah. I mean, everybody has that there. You can right. choose to be right. bad. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you can but choose. They're, they're, they're four years of being nurtured. So, you know, that's, that's yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Oh, we need all of the social psychologists to to, 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 to right. do 90 second blurbs on and right. make these people reflect and say you are becoming sociopathic. You are becoming psychopathic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's two women, oh. who are, you know, talking, talking about popping Pelosi. Oh, my they God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. there's who knows there. Maybe they're just the tip of the iceberg. Right. No? Right. Right. No. <laughs> it's scary. It's a bit I, scary. I know, but I, I think it's 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 very important not to rest. Unfortunately, take your rest in fifteen minute increments and when you can. Yeah. 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 Stay on your toes, but um, man. Yeah. 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 So. Well, I will keep you informed of more culinary. I mean, this French class, unfortunately, usually is uh, an hour and 20 minutes. And it was just enough time to take a couple of chunks out of this film and show it in its almost entirety. But uh, unfortunately, they had a last minute change. And, and uh, But uh, their focus for the year is food and, and um, French language. So... Uh, Easy to find things, yeah. So there'll be more. I will post more. <laughs> right, Kitty. Very nice to see you again. Yeah. You. Okay. Good to talk with you again, Gordon. Okay. Take bye care. Bye-bye.